everybody joining us today for the Top Core webinar. My name is John Lochner. I'm with uh, Top Core uh, from the Penn State uh, University uh, part of Top Core. Um, and we have a, a great webinar coming today. Dr. David Yoxheimer uh, with uh, with Penn State will, and I'll give him a full introduction in just a moment. Uh, we appreciate David joining us today. Hey, and I've, uh, as I've mentioned before, as you join, if, if you wouldn't mind just going into the chat, introducing yourself, tell us, tell us who you are, where you're at, give us a little forecast. Anybody joining you there? Uh, we really enjoy seeing uh, some of the some some names that we're familiar with and feel like we get a little reacquainted uh, this once a quarter uh, webinar series we have. And we also love seeing new names. So uh, please introduce yourself in the chat pod. Uh, for, for those of you, and next, uh, for those of you that uh, have heard this before, uh, you're familiar with it. And that is that Top Corps uh, trains and conducts workshops uh, for professional development, to increase your knowledge. Uh, it's for oil and gas field inspectors, regulators, and policymaking uh, personnel. And, uh, and those are the folks that we generally see in our workshops. Uh, we do a lot of training uh, within the United States. Uh, every, uh, every state that produces oil, practically, I think we have had uh, people from in our workshops or in our webinars. Uh, Customers in larger uh, international arenas we, we work with, have worked with, and continue to work with. Somebody that you may know, um, the first time the name's up here on the screen, I just mentioned Dory Coy, our program coordinator out of the University of Texas at Austin, is our main contact for, for questions regarding the, uh, the regarding Top Core and the Top Energy Training Program. We are supported by many, many uh, organizations and in a lot of uh, industry uh, and and others, uh, NGOs that support the top core mission. And here's a quick brief slide of many of the people that help us year in and year out. And we're so appreciative of the people that uh, represent these companies. And I hope some of you are here today uh, that support us and enable us to do the workshops and bring uh, oil and gas regulators and policymakers into the universities for uh, for the workshops that, that we conduct. We do look at this. Uh, it's offered as uh, as as an educational outreach uh, as part of the Top Energy Program. We call it Top Core. As we go through today's webinar, which we attempt to do uh, uh, every quarter, as to provide a professional development opportunity for you. Something that may interest you uh, is some, is what we try to do. So in the course of this, if you have comments or suggestions on something you'd like to know about, we certainly have a lot of depth at the three universities that are part of Top Corps, which are, as you can see the logos down below, the Colorado School of Mines, uh, the University of Texas at Austin and the Pennsylvania State University. Uh, so we've got a depth plus industry contacts that will allow us to reach out and find the kind of uh, topics that you're interested in. Today is recorded uh, and, and you will receive a link to it later on if you want to pass it along to some of uh, your folks that have not joined and couldn't join us today. Uh, also, uh, as uh, Dr. Oxheimer goes through his presentation today, if you have a question, uh, Dave will take questions at the end of his presentation. Uh, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, it sure will help us stay organized if it's in the Q&A pod and not in the chat pod. Sometimes we miss them if they're in the chat pod. Q&A certainly helps us make this go smoother. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce to you today's uh, webinar presenter, uh, a friend and colleague from here at Penn State, Dr. David Yoxheimer, who is a research professor and hydro hydrogeologist and a research associate with uh, uh, with the uh, Marcellus Center for Outreach and uh, and Research, which is we we know it as MCOR. Dave earned his uh, his BS in Earth Science from Penn State and completed his PhD in Geosciences. Previously to joining MCOR and Penn State, he spent 18 years as a consulting hydrogeologist with expertise in water supply development, karst hydrogeology geophysical surveying, environmental permitting, shale energy geology, and, and integrated water resource management. Dave was appointed by the governor, uh, by Governor Wolf, 
to be a voting member of the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection's Oil and Gas Technical Advisory Board and currently serves as its chairman. For if, if any of you uh, that are here today were at the workshop, the Top Corps workshop in Pittsburgh last week, you had an opportunity to hear a presentation by Dave. And during that presentation, he gave us a couple sentences, just enough to tease us about this topic. And so, Dave, welcome. I've been waiting to, to hear this presentation since you teased us with that little bit of information last week. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, and thanks for being with us. All right. Great to be here. Let me uh, scroll backwards here a second. I'm giving all my punchlines away already. Boy, oh boy. Um, thank you, John, for the uh, nice introduction. It's uh, it's great to be here. Uh, depending uh, where you are, uh, good afternoon or uh, good morning. And uh, yeah, so we want to talk about uh, potential lithium resources in the produced fluids of the, uh, the Appalachian Basin. Uh, I'm going to give you a Sort of a lot of background and context on on lithium, how we're using it, uh, where we've historically uh, mined it uh, or otherwise imported it, and uh, then give you a sense of again the uh, the lithium resources in the uh, produced fluids within both Pennsylvania and the Appalachian Basin's uh, uh, produced fluids, which are again the uh, the, the brines that come out along with the uh, oil or gas. So we're kind of focused on the produced fluids from, from um, shale energy production. So I'm not really going to talk so much about the, uh, the produced fluids from the conventional um, industry, but mostly from, you know, the shale gas uh, and shale oil um, industry. So again, uh, the topics of the day will be to look at the overview of uh, lithium significance in, in the marketplace. What do we use it for? Why is it important to us? Uh, where do we get it both uh, globally and uh, nationally? Um, some of the, the current uh, major uses and, and demands for that. Um, how we've been extracting it and um, producing uh, lithium. And then again, dial in on potential lithium resources and the produced fluids of the uh, Appalachian Basin shale formations. And then just kind of discuss some implications for uh, future lithium supplies. And then uh, hopefully we'll have a, uh, a robust uh, question and answer session. Although I told John to only uh, give me the uh, the easy questions, so John, um, I appreciate. I would appreciate that. Uh, obviously, I'm just just kidding there. But uh, so just to give you an overview of the of the lithium. Whoops, uh, its importance out there. Um, when we think about the global demand. Uh, we're current production is around, uh, 540,000 metric tons per year across the globe. However, if we look at some of the forecasts out there, uh, it, by the end of this decade, we're looking at about a five to almost six fold increase, uh, in the, in the demand for lithium. So we're looking at about 3 million, uh, metric tons, and that's according to the world economic forum. Just from 2021 to 2022, we've seen a 21% increase in global lithium production, about 107,000 to 131,000 metric tons, and a 41% increase in consumption from about 95,000 to 134,000 metric tons. Um, and that's according to uh, some recent reports from the USGS, which I will draw on pretty heavily today because they do such good work. Uh, if we look at the uses for, for lithium, as you might imagine, a lot of that's for lithium ion batteries. Um, lithium's relatively lightweight, so it makes for nice uh, batteries for portable electronics, your, your laptops, uh, your cell phones, uh, etc. Um, but really what's kind of driving the demand um, currently is the increase in electric vehicles we're seeing on the road. So we're seeing about 80% of lithium demand for use in batteries. Uh, about 7% in uh, ceramics and glass, about 4% for lubricants, 1% uh, for medical use, and then the other 8% is various uh, industrial applications. Uh, when we look at the uh, produced fluids from oil and gas development, 
Um, they may contain uh, many critical minerals, including lithium, but some of the other battery metals like uh, cobalt and nickel. So there are folks looking at, you know, extracting some of these other, you know, critical minerals or, or rare earth elements from this, basically a waste stream that has, a, you know, a bounty of uh, useful uh, elements in it. So when we look at the uh, the the current and and future demand, uh, again in in the U.S. we're seeing uh, batteries for electric vehicles really driving the demand. Uh, we've got about uh, seventy five thousand tons per year of demand estimated by just twenty twenty five to support the electric vehicle market. We've got uh, on the order of 91 gigawatt hours of lithium battery production that's been built or proposed in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. has about a million metric tons of U.S. or I'm sorry, of, of reserves in the U.S. Um, so what we mean by that are um, basically known uh, uh, quantities of, of lithium, in essence, in the in the ground that you can really kind of bank on. And then um, when we think about the resources, that's sort of the potential uh, reserves out there, but you can't book them because they haven't been fully scientifically uh, verified, okay? Um, you know, we've got one uh, mine, the Thacker Pass mine in Nevada that contains about 75% of the U.S. lithium uh, reserves, but it's not fully permitted. It's not online yet. Um, it's expected to come online over the next year. Um, but, you know, there is some public opposition due to largely environmental concerns there. So um, it's a little hard to predict when that'll actually become operational. Um, but even once it becomes operational, it'll likely take some time to actually be able to extract the, the lithium. There are other potential mines out there. Uh, in Nevada, uh, North Carolina, in California. But again, these are going to take uh, years. You know, typically you're looking at almost a decade to get these uh, these facilities permitted based on uh, history. So if we look at the sources of lithium uh, in the U.S., uh, you know, mostly we're looking in the, the western half of um, the United States for our domestic sources, but I'm just going to kind of run through some statistics here. Uh, the U.S. consumes about 3,000 metric tons of, of lithium annually. We import about 3,400 metric tons, mostly coming from Argentina and Chile, which represents over 90 percent of our, our imports. And then you've got China, Russia, and some other countries that uh, provide us the, the balance of that. Um, the U.S. does both, you know, import and export uh, lithium. So if you're making, you know, various products, you're then exporting those uh, products that contain the lithium. And so you're looking at about 2,700 metric tons in exports uh, last year. And again, there's only one active mine uh, in uh, the Clayton Valley, uh, Nevada facility, and that's producing, uh, they don't actually disclose how much it's producing. It's a sort of a confidentiality uh, situation there. Um, but if you kind of like back out the numbers between the Clayton Valley, Nevada mine and um, some brine that is processed as part of a magnesium mining operation in Utah, we're producing about 2,300 metric tons per year uh, in the U.S., which isn't a whole lot when you're looking at, you know, potential demand upwards of 75,000 metric tons here in just the next uh, few years. Uh, and, and one way to try to make that balance up is to uh, recycle batteries. So as of last year, there were 44 operating or proposed battery recycling uh, facilities in, in the US that uh, recovered the lithium from those facilities. So the, 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 the map here is basically showing, uh, you know, a close up of the, the Clayton Valley facility in, in Nevada. In Northern Nevada is where the, uh, the Thacker Pass mine is proposed. Uh, you've got some um, closed basins, uh, meaning that you have uh, basically lithium 
brine that can be brought up from the subsurface um, and, and, and processed. You know, we do have potential for oil field brines um, that can be used, which we'll talk about in, in uh, detail as we go on through the day here. And then you also have geothermal sources of brine. So wherever you have uh, a geothermal uh, operation, you know, the brine that's coming up there could, in theory, be, be recovered if you had enough uh, concentration of lithium in that. Um, and then we also have, you know, the sort of the hard rock uh, uh, lithium sources, basically um, clays and uh, zeolites, um, which are in, in essence uh, igneous uh, uh, rock formations that have sufficient uh, lithium in them. But, uh, you know, so again, most of these sources are in, you know, the, the Western U.S., um, and then if you look at the, uh, the map, the blow up there of South America, you know, you've got, uh, multiple, um, lithium brine facilities. Basically, again, you're withdrawing, um, brine out of the subsurface, bringing it up. Um, typically you're in an arid region. So you're allowing the brine to, uh, evaporate naturally under the sun. And then once the lithium concentration is high enough, you can then, uh, process the, the lithium. So if we look at just geologically, I just want to give you a sense of, you know, some of the um, scenarios under which you might find a lithium bearing brine. You know, you might find them in uh, older bedrock. Uh, you might find them in, near uh, magmatic or, or hydrothermal fluids. Uh, volcanic ash can represent a source. Uh, you've got um, lowest or uh, windblown sediments can contain. Um, lithium. Uh, you could have uh, a, a lithium deposit that was basically buried and then due to erosion uh, exposed or exhumed at the surface might uh, represent a, a lithium source and in uh, regional uh, groundwater flow. Um, so, you know, again, we're just kind of looking at a geologic cross section that would show um, you know, perhaps you've got a deeper seated fluid that's migrating up along, say, a fault um, and actually, you know, coming up to the land surface. You know, that those are the kind of operations you might see out uh, or see down in um, South America. And then you rely on uh, evaporation to concentrate the lithium uh, in those brines. So there's really geologically a variety of potential um, sources out there, both in essence, basically in the brines in a liquid form. Um, so basically naturally occurring salt waters deep in the earth or in um, trapped in, you know, rock or clay materials, which would require some sort of uh, mining operation. Uh, if we look at it, uh, pan out here a little bit and look at it on a, on a global basis, there are multiple, um, and this is really kind of focused on the, uh, the hard rock or clay uh, deposits. Uh, there are multiple lithium deposits, you know, around the world. Um, you can even see in the U.S. we've got, you know, some up in, you know, the Black Hills of South Dakota and Kings Mountain, North Carolina, which are being looked at as potential um, lithium mining uh, operations. Uh, most of the lithium um, actually being mined nowadays is down in Australia. So you can see that there's multiple um, pegmatite formations, which are in essence a, uh, a igneous intrusion where um, the nature of the geologic setting is that these, these geologic intrusions or igneous intrusions actually contain um, concentrated uh, lithium in, in the rock. So it's a matter of identifying the location of these igneous intrusions and then trying to figure out how to mine it out of the ground where it would then need to be processed uh, at, at, the, at the surface. So if we look at the estimated resources, potential resources out there, you're looking at about 98 million metric tons around the globe. And then the reserves, that is the booked uh, uh, lithium that you can sort of bank on, um, you're looking at about 26 million metric tons. So about a, a quarter of the resources out there are looked at as reserves now. 
So just to give you a sense of the sort of the the rock bearing uh, or uh, or lithium bearing rock formations out there, uh, you know, in the upper left, you've got an outcrop of uh, spodamine crystals in the Black Hills of South Dakota there. And if you look closely, that uh, red oval shows you a, uh, a miner um, standing along one of the uh, uh, outcrops. Um, just for scale. So it gives you a sense that these outcrops are maybe uh, it's kind of comes up to where his feet are. So they might be one or two feet thick. So they're not very thick. So they can be kind of difficult to identify in the subsurface. Uh, up in the upper right, you've got a pegmatite uh, outcrop uh, from uh, Maine. So again, Maine does have some lithium bearing rocks up there. Uh, and in fact, the, the lower left shows some um, uh, elbite, which is uh, also known as watermelon tourmaline. And I think if you take a look at that, you can guess why they call it that, um, which is a lithium bearing gemstone. Um, and so the discovery of that uh, elbite in, in Maine was worth uh, on the order of uh, $40 million, but more so from a uh, uh, sort of a, a gemstone standpoint, not from lithium so that we can use it for industrial or other purposes. Um, and then in the bottom right, you're looking at a uh, salar uh, in Chile, where basically you, ha again, have lithium brines that are either being pumped up or flow up naturally to the surface. Um, and then they're evaporated to concentrate the lithium and then uh, extract the lithium from that with further uh, processing. So just want to give you a sense of what some of these uh, lithium bearing minerals uh, and, and brines uh, look like. So if we look at the global lithium reserve, so again, we're looking at what's, you know, on the books, uh, what you can bank on. Um, Chile has the, the highest reserves with about um, 9.3 million uh, metric tons. Um, that's what the MT stands for there, followed by Australia, uh, Argentina, China. Uh, the U.S. has about the fifth most uh, uh, reserves. And then the rest of the world uh, has about 4.8 uh, million metric tons. So we've got about, again, 26 million metric tons of lithium reserves out there. And then if we look at production from 2022, uh, actually Australia by far had the most um, production, followed by Chile, um, and then China, then Argentina, uh, then the, the United States. Again, that's an estimate because um, they don't actually disclose the actual uh, production from the, the one mine in, in the U.S. And then the rest of the world accounts for about uh, 2,500 metric tons. So you're looking at about uh, 130,000 metric tons of global uh, production of, of lithium from uh, mines uh, and uh, brines around the, the world. Um, so if we look at the, the Clayton Valley, Nevada um, uh, facility, it's basically a, uh, they use extraction wells to bring up lithium rich brine to the surface and then use evaporative uh, concentration um, to basically um, allow, you know, the, the, the water to evaporate off, concentrate the lithium in, in the brine. And once it reaches a certain point, it, it can be uh, process. So the picture in the upper right shows you the scale of the Clayton Valley uh, facility, which has about 570,000 metric tons of, of reserves and uh, about 14 million tons of potential lithium uh, resources. For scale, the if you're looking at that, uh, the, the, the facility there in the sort of upper right of the mining area, there's a I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but there is a uh, a black uh, rectangle there. That rectangle is about a mile long. So to give you a sense of this, you know, this this facility is about, you know, five miles long by roughly two miles wide. So that's about 10 square miles of, uh, you know, surface footprint for this for this uh, facility. And on the left, we're kind of showing the, the sense that this isn't run by one company. There are multiple companies here that all have, you know, some, some rights to extract the, the brine and therefore then process um, the lithium. 
And so you have some rather large companies like uh, Albemarle, which is one of the largest lithium producers in the U.S., and then some some junior um, companies, some smaller operations working there uh, as well. You know, another potential source of lithium would, uh, as we mentioned, be in geothermal brines. Um, so, you know, the this is a figure from uh, the National Renewable Energies Lab. And so they went out and sampled the, the lithium concentrations in these brines that are either coming up to the surface or part of uh, geothermal operations. Um, and the takeaway here is that very few of these uh, geothermal brines have economic concentrations of lithium in them. Um, you know, you know, if you look at the the scale on the right there, you know, you're looking at um, basically parts per million, and you've got uh, pretty low um, concentrations, generally less than um, 10 to 20 parts per million, and just a handful of uh, facilities have concentrations greater than um, 20 parts per million. Um, and just for the sense of uh, the concentrations we're looking at here in in the the Marcellus and Utica shales, you're looking at concentrations on the order of a hundred uh, parts per million. So you know, four to five times more concentrated than you'll find here in these brines. So while they might be plentiful, they're not uh, uh, super concentrated. So if we look at the lithium in uh, the produced fluids uh, in the Marcellus, uh, there have been a few studies that documented uh, a range of lithium concentrations from you know, 75 to 99 milligrams per liter or parts per million down in um, southwestern part of the Marcellus, southwestern Pennsylvania, uh, with a higher concentration, more on the you know, 169 to 282 milligrams per liter up in uh, north central uh, Pennsylvania. And you can see with the chart here, there's a pretty strong correlation between the total dissolved solids concentration, that is the, um, you know, basically the salinity of these uh, brines uh, and the, the lithium um, concentration. So the more saline the brine, the, the higher lithium concentrations. Um, so again, up in north central part of Pennsylvania, where the Marcellus is being produced, um, you're seeing some, you know, pretty, pretty significant uh, lithium concentrations. Um, I don't know if there's a, a magic rule of thumb as to, you know, where the lithium concentrations become economically viable for, for processing. If I had to uh, put a number on that, it would be in excess of 50 milligrams per liter, probably more closer to 100 milligrams per liter. So you can see, again, up in north central Pennsylvania, the, the produced fluids have, you know, very high concentration. So that could be um, favorable for looking at these from a, you know, extraction uh, standpoint. So again, they can, you know, the, the lithium concentrations can vary in, within the same formation, uh, just, you know, a couple hundred miles away. Um, so then you might guess that from formation to formation, they're going to vary um, quite a bit as, as well. So if we look at the potential lithium resources in just Pennsylvania's produced fluid, so we're primarily looking at the uh, the Marcellus, but also to a certain extent, the uh, the Utica. Um, again, I'd mentioned earlier, you know, an average concentration in the in the Marcellus produced fluids is about 95 milligrams per liter. Um, so basically, we're just kind of doing some some basic math here and saying, well, if we've got you know 95 uh, milligrams per liter uh, of lithium in the produced fluids. Uh, and we're producing 10 barrels of produced fluids for every million cubic feet of gas, um, we can start to begin to, you know, estimate just how much lithium is actually in, in, in these fluids. And so, um, again, you know, there have been, as I showed, you know, you might see upwards of, you know, in excess of 250 uh, milligrams per liter, but you kind of have to look at the, you know, the average to get a better sense of just how economically viable, viable this might be on a, on a wider um, basis. But just kind of looking at the numbers here, you've got on the chart, you know, lithium 
uh, expressed in metric tons uh, that can be extracted per year. And then we're forecasting out to year 2050 to get a sense of, in theory, again, this is a forecast, um, how much lithium might be uh, in, in the fluids and how much might be recoverable. And so uh, in 2022, uh, we're estimating that you have about 1,100 metric tons of lithium in the produced fluids from uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and if we look at the, consider the extraction technologies out there, they can extract somewhere between 60% of the lithium with the basically today's technology or up to about 90% of the lithium with the sort of emerging technologies um, that are um, coming into the marketplace literally as we uh, sit here today. And so um, if you look at the, you know, the 60 to 90% recovery efficiency uh, with uh, the, the technologies, um, you're looking at roughly um, 650 to about a thousand metric tons of, of lithium could in theory be recovered from the produced fluids um, from shale energy production in Pennsylvania alone, which is you know roughly a third to a half of the current annual production from the mines in in, in the US. So um, so that's pretty significant just from a domestic standpoint. but in the in again, in the big picture, um, you know, we're looking at some short-term demands in excess of, you know, 75,000 metric tons per year. Um, so again, there's quite a delta there when you're trying to make up that, that potential demand here over a very short period of time. So if we, we look at a little broader and look at the lithium resources across the Appalachian Basin, so now we're including, you know, not only the Marcellus, but now also the Utica Point Pleasant, um, which you're seeing mostly, you know, Utica, Point Pleasant, um, shale energy production in Ohio, primarily Marcellus in uh, Pennsylvania, and then down in West Virginia, sort of a sort of a mixture of uh, both Utica and Marcellus production. But basically, just using the same uh, input assumptions: 95 milligrams per liter of lithium, uh, 10 barrels of produced fluids. Um, looking at the you know the overall production of of uh, shale gas and shale uh, liquids and shale oil production and getting a sense of the the volume of produced fluids here uh, we're looking at uh, basically uh, upwards of two thousand metric tons of lithium in the produced fluids from the Appalachian Basin. Um, which of which, you know, roughly 1,200 to 1,800 metric tons could be recovered collectively from the produced fluids in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and uh, West Virginia. Um, now, again, that there's a big potential there. I should emphasize that because um, to, again, recover the fluids, you'd have to treat all of the fluids somehow, and that's where things begin to... Uh, um, get complicated uh, to be able to centralize, you know, the the sort of the, the waste stream to be able to extract these, these fluids. Um, if we look at the, the lithium um, carbonate prices, so should mention that, you know, lithium isn't sold generally as just pure lithium on the market. It's sold as uh, commonly as a lithium carbonate or a lithium hydroxide or a lithium uh, chloride. So you have to extract it and, you know, provide it as a, uh, you know, a useful commodity out there. Um, so this graph shows the uh, lithium carbonate prices in, in China over the last uh, five years. And so on the left hand, you're looking at the uh, the, the Chinese currency uh, in, in, in uh, yuan. Uh, and so the, you know, you're looking at generally something that was, you know, worth less than a hundred thousand, uh, uh, I guess one is how I'm saying it might be UN. I'm not, uh, very fluent in, uh, Chinese currency, but, um, what I did on the right hand is I put that into, uh, us dollars. So it, uh, make a little more sense for everybody. So you could see that, uh, the, uh, lithium carbonate prices spiked in late 2022, approaching, you know, uh, over, uh, 
85, $86,000 uh, per ton of lithium carbonate. So for every metric ton of uh, lithium, if you turn that into lithium carbonate, that actually adds weight to it. So you're looking at um, increasing the, the weight of the lithium by about five and a half times. So uh, a ton of uh, lithium, metric ton of lithium uh, would equal about five and a half metric tons of, of lithium carbonate. So you can start to understand how we're deriving these values. So again, uh, the lithium carbonate price spiked uh, due largely to the demand for batteries for electric vehicles. And so there was a, you know, kind of a quick uh, spike and now it's kind of coming back down um, to somewhere in the order of, you know, 40,000 or so uh, dollars per, per ton for lithium carbonate. But, you know, again, if you look, if you do the math here, um, you're looking at produced fluids just in Pennsylvania uh, that would have about $200 million of, of lithium uh, in them, uh, lithium carbonate, really. And then, you know, if you look at the, the, the upper Appalachian Basin, so that, you know, the shale energy that's being produced in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia, you're approaching about $400 million of value. And that's using a, uh, the, the, the 2022 average price of $37,500 per metric ton of, of lithium carbonate. So again, those are big numbers, um, but it's only worth that if you can somehow extract the lithium out of all of the produced fluids. So again, that's where things get uh, complicated. Uh, talk a little bit about the, the lithium extraction technology. Uh, if you follow the market at all, um, the term DLE or direct lithium extraction uh, is sort of the buzzword out there. Uh, it's a very promising technology. Um, again, it's really just being commercialized now. Um, it's, uh, but you know, what you're doing is increasing the recovery efficiency of the, the process uh, for lithium from about 60% to upwards of 90%. So that's a, you know, 50% increase in the recovery efficiency. So that's moving the needle quite a bit. Um, you know, there, there are several technologies that are considered uh, as DLE. So it's not just one technology, it's sort of an umbrella term for a variety of technologies, but basically it's a uh, selective absorbent um, technology. So you've got, you know, some sort of filter or some sort of resin that has an affinity for lithium that draws the lithium out of the, the waste, um, waste stream and concentrates it so that it can then be, you know, turned into say lithium carbonate or some other um, commodity. The typical uh, or conventional technology out there is some sort of a solvent acid extraction or a chemical precipitation uh, method. And so that's where you're getting about 60% uh, recovery efficiency. Um, should note that recently the Eureka Resources Facility up near Wysox, Pennsylvania, they have a, a lithium extraction technology, um, which is not, from what I understand, DLE, um, but it's a unique uh, technology that they have a patent on, and uh, they were able to announce that they uh, were able to extract about 90% of the lithium in the waste stream there and produce a 97% pure lithium carbonate uh, product. So that's, again, um, you know, a sort of a game changer in, uh, in the technologies to extract lithium out there. Um, there are, you know, many multiple considerations uh, in this industry. You know, there are multiple new lithium mines proposed in the U.S., um, but they do face uh, opposition largely due to environmental concerns, whether it's the land surface impacts, ecological impacts, or, or water resource impacts. Um, as I'd mentioned, you know, it might take a decade for a facility to be permitted um, and that doesn't even necessarily include the time to actually start to build it and, uh, you know, actually start to extract um, lithium. So um, these are, you know, longer term projects. 
And, you know, as you saw with the price of lithium, it can change pretty drastically over a short period of time. Um, so it's kind of hard to, you know, sometimes justify the amount of capital on a project that's going to take a decade to uh, come to fruition for. Um, something to consider with the conventional uh, techniques where you're evaporating the uh, lithium and concentrating it, it takes about 18 to 24 months to actually uh, process the, 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 the lithium. And um, that's just, you know, the amount of time it takes the sun to evaporate the lithium in order to um, uh, concentrate it sufficiently so it can then be uh, extracted. So again, even if you have you know, a source of lithium, you, you're operating your facility, you know, when you pull that brine up to the surface, you're still looking at upwards of two years until you're able to, um, you know, monetize uh, that, that commodity. And so that's where, you know, the advantage of using, you know, produced fluids as a lithium source, um, you know, they're readily available. You're basically already uh, mining lithium, uh, when you're producing oil or gas, especially out of these shale formations, which have, you know, can have relatively high um, lithium concentrations in the shale, um, which then, you know, is um, dissolved into the, whether it's the effluids you injected down there or the native uh, uh, brines in, in these formations. And when they come up to the surface, um, you know, you can use, you know, whether it's conventional technologies or, you know, one of these higher uh, recovery efficiency technologies to to meet the, the lithium demand. So again, you know, we're taking something that was a, you know, a waste product, something that people are looking to pay to get rid of. Uh, and now it's got, you know, some inherent value in it. Um, so, you know, looking at the, the potential volumes of lithium you're going to get out, it certainly doesn't look like it's going to meet all the demands in the short term, but it's you know part of a portfolio of sources of of lithium out there. So again, uh, it's it's also you know being generated here in, in the U.S., so you don't have to uh, rely on you know export factors uh, in that equation either. So just uh, some some takeaways, and then uh, we can open it up for a Q and A session. Um, so lithium recovery from produced fluids offers a potential cost effective solution to managing these fluids, while also providing a secure domestic source of lithium to meet increasing market demands. Um, again, you know, I'm no, I'm no expert on the lithium market. Uh, but there is a significant gap between the, the amount of supply versus the demand in the U.S., especially when we take into consideration the uh, the numerous battery plants that are being built um, for the electric vehicle uh, market. Um, again, the, the, the lithium prices have been pretty uh, volatile. Again, the, the average price last year was 37,500 tons per metric uh, uh, dollars per metric ton of lithium carbonate, but again, that peaked over eighty thousand uh, dollars in the uh, in the Chinese market. Um, but however you evaluate it, you know you're looking at you know something you're measuring in hundreds of millions of dollars annually, uh, just here in you know Pennsylvania and the Appalachian basin. Uh, basin. So this does represent a significant value added opportunity. Um, you know, depending on how you look at the, uh, you know, evaluate the, the potential here, you know, each barrel of uh, brine, and there's 42 gallons in a barrel, uh, has somewhere on the order of uh, 2 to $3 of lithium in each barrel. So, you know, really the trick is trying to uh, look at that and figure out how to extract it for less than two or three dollars uh, and therefore, you know, show some sort of profit on this. But again, this is a waste product, something, you know, the industry is looking to have managed. Um, so, you know, again, it's sort of a, I look at it as a value added uh, opportunity. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want any of you taking this presentation down to the bank and uh, trying to get a loan based on it. It's just sort of meant to be a, a high level 
um, discussion here to give you a sense of the potential opportunities. Um, you know, the supply chain on this is going to be kind of uh, complicated. Again, trying to get the, the 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 produced fluids to a plant that can treat it. Uh, you know, it would not be a simple task, um, especially to gather all of the fluids in Pennsylvania. So it's very much just a potential evaluation of, of the marketplace. But again, you know, when we're looking at a very critical mineral here that has, you know, high demand in the short term, this does represent a very um, interesting uh, economic opportunity. Uh, but really to look at this, you know, whether it's just in the Appalachian Basin or just in Pennsylvania or more nationally, um, you know, we need some more uh, uh, lithium resource assessment work, get a better sense of, you know, the long-term uh, lithium viability in, in, in these fluids. Um, again, increasing the extraction technology research. So this, op, uh, you know, uh, from a selfish standpoint, this uh, represents a great uh, in industry academic uh, collaboration opportunity. Um, and we do have, I should mention, you know, our critical mineral center here at Pennsylvania uh, State University is something we very much look at these um, kinds of uh, issues and can, you know, evaluate that. So uh, if you're uh, in that uh, scenario, please feel free to uh, to reach out if you think you might have um, some some assessment work uh, you'd like to have done at the at the university level. That's something we'd uh, certainly like to consider. And uh, with that, uh, I'm uh, pleased to take any questions. And I thank you all for uh, attending today's webinar. Thanks very much. Dave, thank you. You didn't disappoint with the tease that you provided last week in the workshop. I appreciate that. That was a whole lot of information, and you've generated some discussion here uh, from the in our Q and A pod. And and I'll and I'll also mention that I I note that we do have uh, some representatives from Penn State's Critical Minerals and from Eureka Resources here with us today as well. Uh, and they've been making some comments uh, in the uh, in the in the uh, chat pod. So, but I'm gonna I'm gonna turn first to the uh, to the Q&A where there are some questions directly. And I, 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 there are a couple here that maybe I should just pass over, but I'm, in case I don't understand. And to the uh, participants, you don't have to worry that I'm going to just uh, uh, throw Dave some softball questions here because I won't know a softball question from a really difficult one, <laughs> Dave. So you're in, you're in good hands here. Uh, Dave, uh, uh, this person says, I've seen information regarding recycling of lithium-based batteries, stating that the recovery of lithium in the recycling process is generally a very low percentage of the lithium in the battery. What work is being done to improve the recovery and recycling process? I will have to admit, I, I do not know the answer to that question. Uh, if I'd be happy to try to do a little more research on it, but I'm not, you know, that familiar with the battery recycling aspect of this. I was kind of focusing on the brine aspect of it, but um, I'd be certainly happy to to dig into that some more if I can. Okay, thanks, Scott. Uh, another question in the produced fluids: Did the study look at if these were from the initial flow back, or and I'm going to read this just the way it is, Dave, and it says, or if this was reused from previous wells? Uh, yeah, so the what I'm showing you, the uh, lithium concentration in the produced fluids, generally those were from uh, wells that were producing over the course of time, and they sampled uh, the produced fluids over time and looked at the concentrations uh, over time. And I know at least in southwestern Pennsylvania, you know, there was some discussion that the 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 uh, concentration of lithium sort of plateaued, you know, right around um, ninety five to one hundred milligrams per liter in the produced fluid. So, um, so they you know appear to increase to a certain degree over time, and then sort of plateau. And that's probably once you are really starting to produce sort of the native brines um, that are more in equilibrium with the formation down there. And with your slide showing the uh, the stream as it's uh, well the the, uh, the the mine and then your flow of of the material, I think you answered this question. But in case there's anything you'd like to add, is lithium carbonate mined like an ore, or is it produced from brine? And yeah, so when you're um, 
looking at whether it's being mined or uh, you know from hard rock or uh, being extracted from from uh, produced fluids, you're basically getting lithium. And then again, I'm not a mineral processing expert either, but basically you're turning it into you know a lithium carbonate or a lithium chloride or a lithium hydroxide. So that's part of the the, the basically the mineral processing where it becomes one of those three species. And, and Dave, I don't know if you've gotten in, into this part of it, but the question is, are there are there supply chain opportunities for companies uh, to develop the, either the infrastructure or the equipment uh, to extract lithium uh, or are they well established? No, I, I again, um, from my vantage point, I think this is uh, an opportunity that's in its very early stages. Um, again, I'd mentioned, you know, Eureka uh, Resources, you know, they've they've developed a technology and I know they've been working on that for uh, multiple years now. And, you know, it's starting to come to fruition for them. Um, and I know talking to some other companies you know, they're looking at trying to extract the lithium out of the uh, the solid waste from that's generated from uh, shale energy production, whether it's the rock cuttings or the, the sludges that are generated from the, the wastewater treatment process. So there are companies that are looking at, you know, um, trying to extract it from, you know, those those sources at well as well. But, you know, generally, you know, I think this is a market that's um, pretty, again, in its infancy, and uh, there should be some uh, opportunities out there. Could you comment on any environmental concerns that would be presented uh, by lithium extraction processes from uh, from fracking waste fluids? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess that's one thing, you know, uh, obviously developing, you know, shale energy has its own uh, share of environmental concerns attached to it, whether it's the land surface disturbance or, you know, the fluids management or potential for, you know, methane migration, uh, other, other, you know, water resource impacts, things of that sort. And, you know, the, the ability to extract lithium from the produced fluids uh, really doesn't add any other environmental issues, they're already kind of baked into the issues with shale gas development. So it's really, you know, sort of uh, already, you know, tied into that part of the process. So really, you're just trying to extract, you know, uh, a valuable resource out of a waste product. So I would say it's, I'm not saying there's zero impact from it, but I'd say it's, it's pretty minimal, um, especially when you compare it to opening up a new mine or something to that uh, effect. Thank you. And Dave, this, uh, I, I think we could go out to like EIA or, uh, or someplace for this, but estimates on produced fluids out to the year 2050 might have some really long assumptions. Do you know what the assumptions are in producing gas in the state are for, for going out to 2050? I... Yeah. So I actually did uh, use the uh, EIA's, uh, projection. So that's the Energy Information Administration. So, you know, I really, again, I I don't pretend to be any sort of a uh, forecaster. I don't have a crystal ball or anything like that. Um, but what I've done is, you know, taken the best available projections from, you know, the EIA and then incorporated them into, you know, my, my projections. So basically it was involves a uh, two percent year over year increase in in gas production, uh, which would basically tie into a two percent year over year increase in produced fluids production, which should you know commensurately tie into the amount of lithium available year over year. So right. it's a pr pretty simple math. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. And uh, the last question here before I move on to a couple uh, in, a, in a hiding place. Uh, while naturally occurring lithium is not inherently radioactive, would, wouldn't would recovered lithium in produced fluids or brine exhibit some radioactivity? Uh, possibly. Um, but when you look at the, you know, depending on how you go about uh, processing the, the, the fluids, you know, 
most of the, when you drop out the, uh, if you're dropping out lithium, you know, chances are you're also getting rid of some of the other uh, cations, namely uh, barium and strontium. And when you drop them out, most of the radioactivity goes along with that, with those, uh, with the barium, strontium, et cetera. So, uh, so I haven't done the geochemistry on this so much, but uh, I believe most of the uh, radionuclides would, would not be attached to the lithium. I mean, and, and you can, you know, again, purify the lithium so that, you know, when it, you know, you're looking to, to sell it on the marketplace, I'm sure you would have to, you know, make sure it meets whatever specs that your customer wants. And I would, would imagine having uh, no or very low uh, radionuclide concentrations would be part of that spec. I guess we're going to throw you in the lion's den here uh, with this and because because we have an audience of regulators. And so but and so this question goes to regulation. And and do you think that given the upside on lithium recovery in Pennsylvania, that there'll be efforts to streamline the permit permitting process to make it more to make it more reasonable? So there there's a little opinion here. Uh well, you know, I, I potentially, I guess, uh, you know, if if you look at the the demand for lithium as part of a, um, you know, on some some level, you could look at it as a national security issue, right? And so, you know, if you want to look at it through that lens, um, in theory, you could say, hey, the you know, we we need the lithium, so we're willing to streamline the permitting process. Um, without sacrificing, you know, health or safety or impacts the environment, if you can do that um, to ensure that, you know, this valuable commodity can be uh, extracted, you know, in the name of national security. Um, I'm not saying that would necessarily occur, but, um, you know, that's certainly one way of uh, looking at it. And and for for anyone that, uh, that, that wants to see a little more discussion about that, there are a few folks in the uh, in the chat pod that are uh, that are exchanging some comments going back and forth regarding that and some other topics with regard to lithium extraction so you might want to read those from for some from for some additional context and information uh, dave with that we are up against our time and just can't thank you enough for for your time and expertise in sharing this i uh, from the questions that were generated uh, and the number of people that have hung in here till the very end I can tell you that it's it's a very popular subject and that you've you've struck a chord of interest with the folks that are here. So with that, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Yoxheimer. Thanks for being with us. And I'll say to the audience that as we attempt to uh, to do one of these kinds of informative professional development uh, webinars every quarter, you can find an email uh, at, for the next one as it comes out and we'll alert you to when that is. And as I mentioned before, if you have some colleagues that aren't on our uh, email list and were, are interested in this topic, you will receive an email directing you to the link of this recording of Dave with this presentation today. And uh, we would sure appreciate if you'd pass it on to your colleagues that haven't seen this for, uh, for their interest as well. So with that, we thank you all again. Thank you, Dr. Yoxheimer, for being with us and for the presentation. We really appreciate it. We appreciate the support of industry, NGOs, and others that uh, bring value to our top core uh, workshops and to all the regulators that attend and policymakers. With that, thanks for joining and have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Stay well.